Welcome to everybody um, to our very first uh, webinar on research participation. I'm Paola Berberino and I'm the CEO of Alzheimer's Disease International. Thank you to the many of you that are joining us today. We have 500 participants from 650 countries, not 600, 60 <laughs> countries, slated to be with us today. So thank you all for joining. Thank you all for taking an interest in this subject which is extremely important in what we are trying to do at ADI. The idea for this webinar came up about a year ago, and it has taken one year for me to be here with our wonderful uh, participants and panelists and with all of you uh, coming to listen to what we have to say. The idea developed originally from a presumption that um, for the many researchers that say there isn't enough people to engage in clinical trials, and for the many people that do unfortunately have dementia and their family that don't know how to access clinical trials or they are worried about knowing more about clinical trials, that there was a breakdown in communication and we could try and bridge this chasm and create a dialogue in which everybody very openly could talk about research participation and its benefits uh, to the wider community. Uh, during this period of time, uh, what became, what started as a theoretical presumption for me became a very practical one because I had to go through this process myself. And I found it just as harrowing as I had expected it to be for the majority of the population. So it's with great pleasure that I open this very first webinar, and I hope it will uh, make the life of everybody participating in research much simpler and easier. Now, this is the first of a series of webinars. The reality is that everything to do with research participation is actually quite complex. So, from at what stage can you participate in a clinical trial and what does that mean for uh, the community and for yourself um, to uh, what actually entails and where clinical trials are available um, there is a lot to discuss and it is not possible to have a panel big enough to answer all of these questions in the first time so we already have a number of webinars uh, set up uh, going forward and also, we will use some of the questions and some of the feedback from this very first one to shape the way that we are going constructing in the future. On top of that, and more importantly, we are going to use some of the discussion that will happen at these webinars to construct the policy of ADI going forward, which hopefully is going to shape the way that the dialogue around research participation is going to go uh, in the forthcoming years. Now, I would like to thank a few people before we start and before I introduce uh, my uh, co-chair for the day, uh, Craig. Um, I'd like to thank from the bottom of my heart, Sergio Gauthier and Ali Atri, who are co-chairs of our medical and scientific panel and whom I first shared this idea with and who are enthusiastic about going ahead with it. So thank you, Serge. Thank you, Ali. I know you probably are on the line. Um, I also would like to thank Wendy Widener, who has been the executor of this uh, program. Without Wendy, we would have not been able to be here. This has been a complex thing to bring together. Thank you, Wendy. She's there here with us. She's not in the shop, but she's here. And um, I also would like to thank uh, Chris Lynch, Annie Bliss, and Jenny McGowan, who have made it possible for all of you to be here today and who uh, have worked tirelessly to make sure that as many people as possible could take part in this webinar today. Now, uh, I did say uh, 500 people, 60 countries, but most crucially, the way that we're going to run this is actually going to be a, a pilot. So we are experimenting how to run it. Uh, it is not going to be possible to take your questions live, but we will take them as we go along. So my role is going to be to moderate the questions and make sure that we answer as many as possible, and we try to move uh, forward very quickly. And now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my uh, co-moderator, who is Professor Craig Ritchie, who is the Chair of Psychiatry of Aging at the University of Edinburgh, and the Director of the Center for Dementia Prevention. He currently chairs two of the biggest clinical trials that there are. So he's uniquely placed to give us quite a lot of answers on this subject. Craig, would you like to introduce okay. the other panelists? Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Paola. And, and um, 
just before I introduce the other panelists, just to sort of re-emphasize some of the housekeeping. Uh, because there are so many folk on the call today, it's impossible to, to, to take sort of verbal questions. So what we've had to do is, is, is mute everybody. But we still obviously are very, very keen to get into a dialogue with people on the call. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, a, an icon which allows you to type in a question. And as Paula said, she'll be able to sort of uh, look at those and pass them to me so we can then take them onto the panel. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention was we are going to be doing a series of polls through the course of the, 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 the hour and a half that we have, just to really sort of gauge you know, your views about certain key questions. And that would be a really good way into the panel and discuss some of those, those issues. So on the panel in the room, uh, I'm joined by three friends and colleagues. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Eileen and Douglas Taylor, who are actually uh, on video from, uh, from Brisbane, Australia. So really, really appreciate them staying up so late this evening to, to, to come onto this call. Uh, and to my left, uh, I've got uh, Alison Searle, who uh, works for uh, Roche. And at Roche, she is the operations program lead for their Alzheimer's program. Uh, to my right, uh, I've got Dr. Gail Madden, who's a professional practice development facilitator at Dementia UK. And finally on the panel, uh, we have Piers Cotting, who's program director for the Office of National Director of Dementia Research, NIH, our National Institute for Health Research here in the UK. So I think really one of the, 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 the best ways to get into this was we, we would, you know who we are now, it'd be really nice if we could get to know who's out there. So we brought up a poll onto the screen um, and as it says, we're interested in learning more about you and can, can you tell us who you are? So there's a, a very variety of options there you should see in front of you. So if you start voting on that now, then we can get to know who you are, uh, given that you know who we are now. Yeah, it's working, we've got a researcher. Excellent. Now, I don't think you can actually see this on your screens. So what I'll do is I'll, you can? Oh, you can, okay. This is like um, this is like watching. Uh, let's not mention it. <laughs> let's not mention any quotes. Shall we? Yeah. Steer, steer, steer clear of any quotes. There are other instructions. <laughs> okay. So it looks like the, um, the, the 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 highest number of people we have about thirty to six percent, a third of people are work or volunteer in Alzheimer's uh, or dementia association. Then a very high proportion of health professionals, 26%, researchers, about a quarter as well, uh, family care partner, 9%, person with dementia, 8%, uh, and uh, a smaller number, 6% from industry. So that's fascinating um, who they are, uh, who, who, who you are out there. The second poll we wanted to do, and we're going to do this um, quite quickly before we get into discussions, um, was regarding um, yeah, your knowledge of dementia research. So how much do you know about dementia research or clinical trials? Can you vote now? Mm -hmm. We're hoping you're all going to be in the fourth column, you know nothing, and that's why you're joining. <laughs> anyway, it seems like, it seems like we're, we may be singing to the choir, as they say. Very good. So I know a little is good because I think you know we're yes. here to we're here to help you come away knowing a lot by the end. And then the final poll we want to do before we pass to Eileen and Douglas for, for, for them to share their story with us is um can bring the next poll. No. <laughs> Now, if you're going to have a webinar with 600 people on it, you can expect a couple of glitches. So here we go. <laughs> Very easy one. Would you volunteer for dementia research? Vote. Please. That's fine. Okay, I think Piers in particular has taken this moment. Everyone, everyone wants to get involved in dementia research. So JDR and JDR too. Thank you. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is um, what we're planning to do over the next hour is, is really sort of structure the, the afternoon or for some people the morning or, or, or the evening around, the, if you like, a journey. The, the, in some ways, dementia research or research in general is about how one gets into research, what's the experience of the person taking part in the research. And also, I think a key issue is what happens after the research is finished. 
So we're going to have lots of questions through the course of the next hour or so. But I wanted to, sort of, in a sense, bring us back to that journey. What happens? Why? What are the barriers? What are the issues about getting into research? What are the what are the key considerations from somebody's in a research program? About you know their experience of that, retention in the project, it's a long term project. But also critically important, what happens when the research is finished? How do the results get communicated back? And what's the kind of the aftercare, if you like? And I think because of the nature of this webinar, what we really want to ensure is we get a truly international flavor to, to, to the questions, the comments, and we're going to be getting back from there. So uh, what I'd like to do now is pass to, to Eileen and Douglas um, for a few minutes, just to tell us a little bit about their experience of participating uh, in research uh, over in Australia. So Eileen, Douglas. Uh. Uh. Good afternoon, evening, everyone. My name's Eileen Taylor, and this is Doug, my husband of 50 years, who is also my care partner. I am living with a younger onset Alzheimer's disease. We both barrack for Dementia Alliance International, the Dementia Australia, and Dementia Awareness Advocacy Team. My experience of being in research started after my diagnosis with Alzheimer's in 2009. At the time of receiving the news, I dissolved into tears with visions of my dad's experience of Alzheimer's disease going through my head. I was devastated. Imagine you wake up one morning and your computer has been switched from a PC to a Mac and the QWERTY keyboard is suddenly azerty. Now trying to play Ma Young with the new keyboard while your hands are tied together and your head is buried in a bucket of jelly. Now maybe you understand how dementia can change and mess with your mind. Eileen had just seen a neurologist after this initial consultation with the doctor and he suggested that she go on a dementia clinical trial. Uh, he recommended one which we followed up on, so Eileen agreed. So that's how ori originally we got involved with uh, dementia research. The thing about it that appealed to us the most was that the research seemed to offer a ray of hope. And we believed that hope was important because hope would at least provide some light in the gloom that we were facing in, from our past experiences with Eileen's dad. Hope was important as I was concerned for my sons and for my sons and grandchildren and for future generations, especially since I had a genetic link. I also saw it as a worthwhile exercise as I also had an interest in research methods. I joined the research team at a local Brisbane hospital in Queensland, Australia. I was personally involved in three clinical trials over seven years. Up until the end of the last trial, I got the best care and support. I always attended monthly visits accompanied by Doug. The research staff were patient with me and listened to my needs when on site. For instance, in the last trial, I was able to sit in a chair with a pillow under my arm while I got the drug infusion rather than for me to lie on a bed. Sometimes Hamish was there too. And it was usually in my hand. Depending on who it was that did this, they could get the vein in one attempt. However, I have experienced three or four attempts of both hands before they achieve their goal. Ouch, painful. We were never out of pocket except when we wanted a cappuccino from the hospital coffee shop. I was given taxi vouchers if Doug could not attend due to work commitments and parking was always paid for and much appreciated. It was often a full day daytime commitment once a month and the research team often used mm. us to help them to promote dementia research in resourcing funding for the program. When the trial ended suddenly due to the results not being statistically significant, it was a big shock. We were in the UK on a six week holiday 
when the researchers notified us via email that the trial was over. On returning to Australia, I did have a final visit with them fi to finalise things, mostly medical, but certainly no psychological counselling support. The abruptness of the trial ended so suddenly and it left me with a great sense of loss. Once again, I was devastated, but also shattered and disappointed as they had been talking about me getting the drug on compassionate grounds after the trial when it went onto the market, supposedly in the June or July of 2017. We'd been told that there was evidence that, that I had improved in all the MRI scans and COG tests I did, and I felt it was working for me. I thought, wow, I had given this particular research trial almost five years of my life. The loss of being cut off from the trial was so suddenly left me feeling angry as I had, I, <laughs> as I had happily endured the infusions, the MRIs and a radioactive PET scan. I was committed to seeing it through. My anger led me to do a lot of crying. It was a real loss to me. After all, it was supposed to go on the open market in the June of 2017. What started out with hope ended in great disappointment and loss. Although now I have slowly reached a point of acceptance and I'm looking to another trial. We believe that researchers need to appreciate that uh, people are participating in trials are vulnerable. When Eileen signed up for the trials, we thought we knew what was happening and we discussed the pitfalls uh, that both of us might face. But we think it was the suddenness of the way it stopped that shocked us the most. A thorough debrief with some psychological support from the research team and hospital would have made things much easier for us to both accept. It's been a challenge for both of us in dealing with the losses and the grief that we experienced after the loss of Eileen being on the trial. So let me say a little about language used in research. Sadly, the language used in research more often than not continues to label us, people with dementia, negatively further exacerbating the stigma and stereotyping of people with dementia. Research, I think, is an intense experience with many different facets to face. I believe researchers need to be aware and more sensitive of people living with dementia, especially in the language and the use of negative words, words used in describing dementia. The language guidelines have been around a few, few years now for, the, for people living with dementia, yet we still see researchers referring to the person as a patient. The language guidelines declare that the word patient not be used when, when used outside the medical context. So the use of positive language is paramount, otherwise it can sound derogatory and add to the stigma surrounding diagnosis in dementia. Another key area for health professionals and researchers to be aware of is the concept of prescribed disengagement. Prescribed disengagement is when you're told to go home, get your end of life affairs in order, and get acquainted with aged care. Dementia seems to be the only illness we know where people are told to go home and prepare to die rather than fight for their lives. The strange thing about this is that we experienced the same thing just a couple of weeks ago after Eileen had a consultation with a dementia specialist here in Brisbane. At this consultation, Eileen was told by the specialist who she'd only seen twice 
that there was nothing more that she could that could be done, even though she'd also been told that her uh, executive functioning had declined by 15 to 20 percent. Uh, and she said, well, the guy, the, the specialist said, look, you know, if you need any help, just go and see your, your GP because there's nothing more we can do. So I was there when this happened and it felt extremely dismissive as if Eileen really didn't count or was not really important. What's amazing about it as well is about additionally about the same time, about two weeks ago, we found another clinical research trial that was going to be happening here in Brisbane that we contacted. The people on the trial rang Eileen and they spoke with her on the phone twice Twice, and they said, uh, we'll get someone to call you in two days when we'll kind of arrange all the details and we'll follow up with you. Well, I'm still waiting. That was pre prescribed disengagement. Deja vu. It was like that after the clinical trial that I'd been on for so many years and was told by the research team last year that I was no longer needed and felt abandoned and without any emotional support. That was prescribed disengagement. Kate Swaffer, who I'm sure you all know, and Lee Fei Lo, who is a researcher from a university in Sydney, shared results from a focus group uh, interviews that they conducted in 2015 and 16 and compiled and wrote a book called Diagnosed with Alzheimer's or Another Dementia. And they write in that book, they say that listening to consumers is the best place for researchers to start. And it's not just about choice. It's fast becoming about human rights for people with dementia. So when Eileen and I were getting ready that for, for doing this little chat today, we, we compiled a couple of questions that we thought maybe the researchers might need to think about answering. The first one is, uh, what does it mean to be engaged or involved in health research as someone living with or alongside a person with a condition or an illness or a disease, or in this case, dementia? It means being included, included in the research pro process, not simply as a research subject, but as a direct contributor. It's about inclusion. Our second question was, what sort of barriers does the person with dementia face in research with respect to engagement in research? Language and the concept of pres prescribed disengagement are two major barriers. Thirdly, what choices do researchers offer on whether and how to engage the person with dementia together with their care partner? Also, there are compelling reasons to engage care partners. This should not be taken as the equivalent of engaging the person living with dementia. And our last question is, how has the impact of engaging persons with dementia and their care partners in research being evaluated? Unfortunately, the person with dementia's engagement activities in research related to, to dementia, we feel are not always well described in journal articles. So more complete reporting would help to advance knowledge in this area. Highlighted majorly in recent Canadian study, which Doug can do. Yeah, there was a recent Canadian study that I came across only last week, actually. It was a, a wonderful article, a rage of researchers. I won't say all their names, but the first name is Bethel, if you want to look it up. And, and it was called Patient Engagement in Research Related to Dementia. And there again, you see the word that Eileen talked about earlier about that word patient. So please remember... If you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. We're all different. So we are glad that the ADI is encouraging people to talk about dementia research and demystifying trials. Both of us have found that the research is definitely an empowering experience and it should and could offer people with dementia some and their care partners the offer of hope. And we hope that that's going to be the case as it moves on in the future. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Eileen, and, and also Douglas, for that candid, very powerful, I guess, um, narrative of your journey uh, before, during, and after, particularly after 
a, a research project. And I think it sets a fantastic foundation for the next hour for, for our ongoing discussions. There was one question that, that we had was, I mean, specifically, this was a drug trial that you were involved with originally. Is yeah. That yeah. Pharmaceuticals. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. So I'd, I'd like to open up on the panel here. And we're also going to come back to you for some of the questions later, with Eileen and Doug, Douglas, sorry. Um, yeah. But maybe starting with peers, um, from your perspective, your, your, your experience, you've been obviously working in this field for many years. Um, what do you see as being the, what drives you, what are the benefits of being in clinical research from your perspective? So I think it's really interesting listening to Eileen and Douglas there. It, it, the thing that I've seen most from the people who are living with dementia and have been involved in research is exactly that both hope and sort of rebuilding um, their own engagement in their disease yeah. and, and mm -hmm. taking back control. So I think there's a huge amount of that. that. That whole discussion of what happens at that diagnosis and falling off the cliff and feeling that you, you know, the despair and the lack of current treatments and all those sorts of things can be a very negative and a very, a very difficult thing to go through for a lot of people who receive that diagnosis. Um, I mean, you'll have more experience in terms of delivering that diagnosis, but I've seen research be tremendously powerful in terms of building back up, uh, and I think Eileen and Douglas have talked about that absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, also from your perspective, I mean, from a pharmaceutical industry's perspective, I mean, the same, same question about the benefits, but maybe also exploring a little bit about the experience that, that Eileen and Douglas had at the end of this trial, some of the, the, the thinking around that. Yeah, so for the, for the benefits of that, I think similar, I'd say similar to peers, uh, hope is the word that comes up time and time again, and that's regardless of disease area, actually. Uh, in terms of the end of a trial, um, that is a really difficult and unpleasant situation. So, you know, firstly, let, let me say that, that I, I find your feedback really compelling and will definitely take it back into my company. Um, a clinical trial is an experiment. I mean, we don't know if the treatment works when we go into it. That, that's the purpose of doing it. So obviously, we can't guarantee a positive outcome. Um, and if a positive outcome it, it does result, then obviously what you had been led to expect in terms of post-trial access uh, is absolutely, I, I think, certainly for my company, I think most companies, um, a, a priority nowadays. Um, in, the, in the event of a negative trial, uh, I absolutely take on board your feedback that maybe we need to think a little bit more about how we communicate that. Um, we provide information to the researchers at the hospitals but um, we can't provide information direct to patients very quickly because everything that we provide has to be reviewed by an ethics committee. Um, but we can, I think, perhaps talk more to sites about how best to support people in this instance and whether they might have alternative research to offer them rather than just closing the door and saying, thanks, goodbye. So, so Gail, I mean, again, in, in, in many years of experience in terms of you know, running the network in Thames Valley and also as, as a practitioner who delivered the research, again, what, what, what drove you, what were the things that you saw at the benefits, but also maybe some of those considerations that the island dogs were talking about from your perspective as a practitioner. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting to hear that story and and, um, and that experience for you, Eileen and Dalton, and I know that in my years working um, in the research world, it certainly um, happened to a number of people as well. I think um, I think hope. Everyone said it already. Um, is is all often uh, the reason why people get involved, and I think there is also that sense of wanting to give back, mm -hmm. of wanting to to do something to help others, um, which I think is lovely. But I think you know what's really important, and what I what I always try to do and what I continue to think is so, so important um, in, in the world of research is the fact that people like yourselves, um, Eileen, are consenting to take part in this. And it's really our responsibility to, to deal with expectation, I guess. 
and to be able to explain to you um, the information that's coming out from the pharmaceutical companies potentially if it, if it is a drug trial. I think it's so, so important. But also, as you alluded to, that, that, that idea of, you know, everybody with a dementia is, is one person with a dementia. And it, it, you know, that person-centered care that we need to provide, I think, recognizing you as individuals, your families, what we need to do is actually be honest. I think that's a really important thing that I've always tried to do and, and have, you know, would always advocate is that, you know, to try and um, support people through that process. It's about being honest all the way through. No, I think honesty, well, we're, we're, we're things and themes that are emerging here. But I want to pick up, you You, you finished your presentation there, uh, Ivy and Douglas, with those sort of four you know, questions that you, you then answered. And I, I wanted to explore the final question about almost like how you do research about research. <laughs> you know, how we, how we could do better as researchers, maybe co designing some projects with you in terms of really mapping out empirically that journey through the research. So you mentioned the Canadian paper, for instance, but if you were to, to think about what that research would look like, what sort of questions would you want, would you want to be asked? What sort of evaluations would you like to have of that research process? We can go and design the study tomorrow. <laughs> this afternoon. This afternoon, I'll get on it. There's 30, 36, 200 researchers are listening to you right now, no pressure. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think um, that's a good question because I think the bottom line is one of the things that we see or we did see that was happening, we talked about the barriers and the enablers and I think the thing that would help a lot would be to see, and, and I guess it's a two-way thing, there must be barriers and enablers for the researchers but there's also barriers and enablers for the person who's the participant, I guess, in the trial. So from our perspective, I think we're thinking that more about in terms of some evaluation of the relationship that you've had with the researchers during the time of the trial, uh, some discussion about satisfaction about was there clearly defined, if you like, um, um, boundaries and roles that were maybe sometimes discussed, but not always fully perhaps before, but at the beginning of the trial. Um, perhaps a discussion about um, the strengths and the, the, the weaknesses of, you know, again, we're talking about honesty and about transparency. So, you know, any strengths and weaknesses that, that might have been experienced or uh, as feedback to the, to the research team, but also them to us as the participants, if you like, in the trial. Uh, one of the things that we found in the last trial that Eileen was on um, is that we've learned a lot about dementia, if you like, in the journey with Eileen with her dementia. So we've done a fair bit of training ourselves with courses. So it would nice be nice to have some of the information a little bit more jargon free. So some sort of feedback in terms of how can they improve the language or the way that the um, the, 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 the kind of research is, if you like, described in some way. So I guess we were wondering another thing that we kind of talked about was about, is there any way of um, helping us while you're on the trial to maybe even have some training as well provided by the research team to kind of, kind of understand uh, what you're experiencing during the time of the trial. And perhaps one of the things that we found as well, which I think was an issue that's relative to the question you asked is about having regular updates about where you're going. Now, I think someone there mentioned that before that um, when a trial ends that obviously the researchers and the team get to know about it immediately, but the people don't. Uh, well, yeah. we, we kind of only got to know about it when we were on holiday and it came in an email. So that was probably, yeah. you know, even worse, I suppose, in some way. Um, so that ability to kind of keep us informed as well. Uh, so having some sort of even a newsletter once a quarter or whatever it is, depending on how long the trial is going, but at least regular updates. But One of the I things think, that happened when, when, when Eileen was on the trial, we would regularly ask them, can you tell us what's going on? And they would say, oh, 
we don't really know because we're waiting for the drug company to get back to us. So, you know, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think you've set some, some very strong objectives for us to go away and think about. And for those in the know, yeah. you've also been a strong advocate for adaptive trial design. Some people understand what I mean by that. So, um, updating yeah. all the way through the trial. So, uh, let's, let's take that on board. So, um, what I'd like to ask the panel around me here now is again, from your experience, not, you know, I'm not necessarily participated yourself in a research program as mentioned, but I mean, again, coming back to the values and enablers, and I think I'd like to focus towards the end of this discussion about the enablers, I'd like to be you know, finishing a positive, but from an emotional or a, or a practical or a physical attitudinal perspective, what, what maybe Gail first, what, what do you see as being the the main barriers to people getting involved in research. I mean, obviously your experience is in the UK, but it might be something we can maybe generalize more broadly. What do you think stops people getting into research? If I'm totally honest with you, I think in my Being experience- Being honest, we don't want this honesty here. We want honesty. You said honesty earlier, so it's, let's stay honest. It's the word research. Okay. I think it's quite a barrier in itself because I think it causes anxiety in people. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's, um, it's just a, a, a word that I think people then immediately think of white coats, they think of the phrase guinea pig. Um, so that's a, that word research is a barrier to the person with dementia or is it a barrier to the finish? I think both. Again, so um, I, question slightly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think both. So certainly when we've spoken to in, you know, when I've been recruiting people with dementia um, and their families, care partners into research, they need reassurance, they need a, a real understanding of what's going on, but equally when I have talked to healthcare professionals about research and asked them to talk to people that they might be supporting about getting involved in research, their anxiety has often created a barrier and, and they've sort of gate, been gatekeeping and said I don't think that my people that I work with would want to get involved yeah. and, and that's caused almost a double barrier for people to have access to research. So Alison, there, we estimate there's 800,000 people in the UK living with dementia and yet when you run a clinical trial in the UK, you get 30 participants. What's the values? Um, in addition, I think the we need participants, uh, I guess, to initiate the process. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, um, your general practitioner, or whoever the first doctor you go and see, is likely not going to be the one involved in clinical research. So you've got to get on the referral pathway. And if your first point of contact in the medical profession is not aware, the families, particip potential participants, have to be aware that the research exists and maybe even do some research them, themselves online to go in armed with the right information to have the discussion. Uh, and that lack of knowledge, um, it, I think is one of our bigger challenges at the yeah. moment. So just, just briefly before I go to Piers on this, with the same question about the barriers and maybe some of the solutions actually as well, at least locally. Um, how did you find out about these drug trials? Did you? Well, do tell me, how did you find out about the drug trial that you were on originally? Oh, wait, we're muted, sorry. Sorry, Eileen, we actually put you on mute because of an echo. So, yeah, sorry, okay. can we start again? We, 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 we okay. were very rude, we put you on mute. Um, so, I'm just asking, um, how did you find out about the trial that you were in, that you had the experience you shared with us earlier? Well. I've been on three trials. Um, originally, it was the neurologist okay. who sent me to the hospital. No, he didn't. Actually, there's an interesting oh, part about that. The neurologist that we saw who first recommended that Eileen go on the trial, he gave us this information and he said, oh, he said, the only problem is it's in Melbourne. Yeah. So... We have a son who lives in Melbourne. So we were down in Melbourne visiting our kids down there one time and we contacted the place in Melbourne and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we'd be interested in you being on the trial. The only problem is, though, you're going to have to fly to Melbourne once a month and we're not sure whether our budget would cover that. So the lady that I got to know then speaking in Melbourne, she said, I don't know why you want to do it here because they're doing the same trial in Brisbane. Oh, 
Oh, really? So she gave us the name of what where the trial was in Brisbane, and it turned out to be exactly the same trial. So the neurologist that we saw, that Eileen saw in Brisbane, referred her to a, a trial that was happening in Melbourne, which is, you know, 1,500 k's away. Yeah. So, so I think this is something I want to go to views on this, because there is actually some questions we had earlier about how a lot of clinical research will take place within five miles of a university teaching hospital, but not everyone lives within five miles of a university teaching hospital. And this is something I think we need to address, particularly at a global level, not just in, not just in sort of uh, in the UK, North America, etc. But peers, barriers, how, how the NIHR sought to address those over the years? Well, it's really interesting, isn't it? The, this issue of uh, attitudes and people's beliefs around venture uh, research, I think you're absolutely right. But I also think there's a, a change in that, and there has been a change in that over the time, certainly in the UK, I don't know more broadly about in other countries. Um, and we see now, I think, quite a lot of people who are interested, do find out there's a lot of information out there online, do find out about research and want to take part. So I don't disagree that, that, that there's a perception issue, um, but I think there's also a large sort of cohort of people who are hungry to take part in research. Um, so I think it's about making that easy. It's about making it easy for the information about research to be found. Um, it's about making it easy for people to self-declare their interest in research. And that's what we've tried to do in the UK and we're now trying to do in Australia. And Douglas and I have been involved in that work, which is create systems whereby it's very easy just to just to um, essentially sign up to wanting to find out about research and be matched to potential research opportunities. So those type of systems, of course, are largely going to uh, be beneficial to people who are already engaged in research and already want to find out about research. Um, I think we need to do more around education and changing the way people, both people affected by by dementia and clinicians. And I should just say my last clinical job, uh, I experienced it very directly. In, in our clinical service, despite being next to one of Europe's largest um, research centers in dementia, our clinical service didn't prefer people. You know, the sense we had in the clinical service was it was a burden. You know, yeah. So I, I experienced that paternalism, it's, it is real. I think I should make a comment here for the benefit of those that are watching. We did try today to have a general practitioner, i.e. a family doctor in England, uh, to join this panel. And unfortunately, um, the doctor that was related to the other panel could not join us because they were not well. And um, that is something that is seemingly increasingly uh, taking a shaping up importance because if family doctors are not aware of what is happening in the research community, and clearly the network of family doctors is very large, and the trust that family put in their family doctor is of another level in comparison to a specialist that they may have seen at the same time as receiving a very traumatic event of a diagnosis. So there is a piece of work that undoubtedly has to be done. And the more I travel, the more I hear it from everyone, that primary care is crucial. And the education of primary care doctor is crucial. So we hope in a future um, uh, webinar to be able to really expand on this particular topic globally. I Sorry, think, Greg. No, 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 thank you. And I was actually going to come to you anyway, Paolo, because I think one of the things we talked about there were the barriers that we've got, you know, the Australian experience. And from us, we have we have sort of a European or a UK experience to some of these barriers. But I mean, the issue about Brisbane to Melbourne is probably magnified, you know, more so in low and middle income countries about being able to connect with the research that's taking place. Have you any sense from an ADI perspective about what are those barriers that are in low and middle income countries being involved in the research? So thank you, Craig. In, in the next webinar, we will explore this topic in greater detail and we will invite some of our members, of ADI members, we have members in 94 countries, who um, lament not being able to access clinical trials. Now, barriers are of all kinds. Um, let's remember that in some countries you do not have specialists of any kind. You have no neurologists, or you have no geriatricians, you have nothing really that can help. You have no diagnostic equipment, there are no MRI scans, 
there are no possibilities of doing any other technique, and there are no pets. So effectively, uh, we do need to bring those countries where there is the opportunity or the possibility into that discussion. One of the barriers are obviously regulatory. Um, once again, traveling around, one learns a lot about some, in some cases, barriers to regulation that may have been put in place in order to safeguard the population of certain diseases have uh, in the end become barriers to um, taking part in other clinical trials, like in the case of Alzheimer's disease. And certainly there is a role for the scientific community to help remove those barriers. Because in some cases, recently I was speaking with someone about Indonesia. Indonesia is a very large country with a very defined population and they are not taking part in clinical trials. And they could be a country that does take part because the educational provision, the university, the research center are very high level. So there's no reason why they shouldn't take part. So certainly, this is something that we will uh, examine further. But it is the, a fact that uh, for every country that has a barrier, that barrier seems to be different. So it is not so easy because so often it depends on regulatory, legislative, policy issues, which of course will vary from country to country. And that is the wonderful thing about ADI, but also the challenge. So I invite everybody here that is uh, listening in from uh, countries which are not uh, the UK or Australia, where we are currently based and what we are discussing, to please uh, let us know in the feedback of this webinar whether your experience, whether you have had issues um, focusing on and, and, and getting access to clinical trials. And I thank particularly the person from Malawi that has sent that very specific question on participation. Africa is a continent where it's really, really difficult to take part uh, in clinical trials at the moment. So, so just, just building on that answer, not to you, I mean, clinical trials, low and middle income countries, is the, the challenges that you, the pharmaceutical, uh, from a pharmaceutical company perspective, have in, in, in running or operating costs? Yes, yeah, so. Um, Some of the challenges are uh, getting approval for the trial and, and um, what we, uh, how long that will take is often more challenging in countries, particularly if they're not do, used to doing clinical research. Um, and if, you're, if you have a certain time frame to complete a trial, sometimes that makes life difficult. Um, but I think even more than that, it's often, um, what I'd call infrastructure challenges. So for example, we might need certain equipment or people with certain qualifications um, uh, and experience to run a trial. Okay, we were just talking there about um, the conversation thus far for the last half hour or so have been really very much about drug trials. And in particular people, um, we were also questioning whether or not people with dementia were the only ones who were suitable for, for a drug trial for medical research. So, 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 Gail, from your from your perspective, the um, the non pharmacological interventions. Yeah. So, yeah. As I um, what I was saying, and I got cut off mid flow, unfortunately. But was just they, that they weren't related. But yes, <laughs> maybe it was something I said. Um, <laughs> was just the importance of recognising that um, clinical trials are obviously um, really, really useful and important for us to have, but it's also equally important for us to recognise that there are people living with, um, living with dementia now and families experiencing dementia now. And so it's, it's just as important for us to think about ways to help support um, and intervention potentially that might be able to people that are living with, with the illness as we speak. So um, I've been involved in, in quite a number of different non-interventional um, studies and interventional studies, but that haven't been drug trials. Um, just, I suppose, to give you a quick, quick flavour, really. Um, so I've been involved in studies that have looked at visual disturbance in people uh, with dementia. I have also been involved in a study that was looking at whether exercise helps people with dementia. Um, you know, whether it helps them with their um, quality of life and, and also with their cognitive you know, memory sort of problems and symptoms. 
Um, but also, um, I was involved in a study that looked at carer support, which again, I think sometimes we overlook. It's really important, I think, to remember the family, the, the care participant, the, the whoever it is that is there alongside the person living with dementia. We recognise that it, the whole family is often impacted on. And so this particular research was looking at uh, whether having peer support from another person who lived with somebody with a dementia was a really, um, you know, was, was beneficial for new carers of people who were diagnosed with um, dementia. So, you know, some really interesting things going on out there that I think it's important to, um, to remember. So, if you're just, I mean, just feed you in a little bit, I know that um, in the registers that you run, a lot of people are healthy volunteers. Mm -hmm. And so it's a non farm of dementia, but also maybe those of the dementia. Yeah, that's the kind of Yeah, I mean, to put it into context, so in the last three years, and this is just, it's just in the UK, the UK is a fairly, if you, if you outside of America, the UK is a you know, fairly research active uh, place, probably, you know, certainly in the sort of top six or seven in terms of uh, the amount of um, clinical trial activity going on. In the last three years, we've delivered 34 medicinal interventional clinical trials. And in that time, there's been about 450 plus non pharmacological trials going on. So. In the register that, that we, we run and in the sort of National Institute for Health Research, the infrastructure in the UK, we've probably put about 1,600, 1,700 people have gone into clinical trials and some 30,000 are taking part every year in, in the sorts of research that Gail's talking about. So much as clinical trials are absolutely critical, uh, they only represent actually a small part of the entire range of research that, that is going on. And it's really important, I think, Maybe talk to the thing we talked about earlier in terms of you know, what happens at the end of a, of a clinical trial. If we were able to bring people into an environment where they are, they are engaged in different types of research or able to at least access those different types of research, that may be one way of, of dealing with that. In terms of your second question, Craig, um, yeah, we, so we run a, um, a register where people sign up to be involved in research, as I said earlier. And of, of that register, we've got about 40,000 people in the UK on that now, and only 15% uh, of them are people with dementia. So it's a broad group of people, and yet even in that much wider group of people, one in four of them are taking part in a study of some description. So it's absolutely not the case that the research in dementia is only looking for people with dementia. You yourself are, of course, involved in prevention, risk reduction, um, you know, so the st studies that require, I've been in one of your studies. You have, you have. Yeah, you're, you're, a, you're a participant. Yes, sir. But, and that's a fantastic segue, Piers. It's as if you're reading my mind. Because <laughs> the mind of our, our audience, because we did get a question just just came through there about are all the drug trials, and I'll, I'll expand that, are all the trials uh, set up to cure or prevent? And maybe I can answer a question myself. But because the research that, 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 that we are fortunate enough to be part of across Europe, maybe so global, uh, sort of platform of research around dementia prevention. Um, I think that is very much about seeing how we can intervene in the earliest stages of diseases. We have to understand those diseases, how they interact with risk factors, etc. Um, and a lot of the studies, the finger study, which is expanding all over the world, is a multimodal lifestyle intervention to optimize the healthcare. These are things that people are trying to do to sort of change the course of disease before dementia develops. Um, and notwithstanding those lifestyle interventions and working out how to identify those high risk groups, certainly I think from a pharmaceutical perspective, a lot of the drug trials we're now seeing coming through are um, trying to, again, prevent dementia developing. And I think one of the biggest challenges of that is, and like I'm sure you're a test to this, is how do you go in early enough? But when is the stage of illness where you need to get in and before it becomes too established and for the drug trials or the, or the lifestyle interventions won't really make a difference. So are the trials to cure? I think, to be honest, I think if, if, if someone has a dementia syndrome, then I think we're, we're looking at better symptomatic treatments that have a more meaningful impact on the quality of life. But at an earlier stage of disease, I think certainly prevention is the, is the target. Um, so, we will have answered the question. I'm completely out of kilter to ask a question. So, let me go back to my notes. Um, so, there's, there's, there's the one here about how doctors are informed about research. Um, because, you know, you, you had a fantastic experience there. You saw a neurologist in Brisbane, and they said you have to go to Melbourne, because the neurologist in Brisbane, he or she didn't realize that the clinic just down the road was actually doing that research. But 
let's talk about that. How do we get out the information to the doctors, to the nurses who are actually face to face, to be able to know, yes, this is going on in our local? I don't know, Gail, maybe you want to get that one first. Well, um, I might lean more towards peers to answer this one, to be honest with you, only because um, I know what was happening three years ago. Um, and, and three years ago when I was it might working... Not have changed. Well, yeah, absolutely, it might not have So three years ago when I was working in my role, and part of my role in recruiting people into research was to get that word out there. So uh, the research would come into the research team, and we as clinical research nurses would have the responsibility of going out in local areas where we were employed through NHS trusts, through hospitals and GP surgeries um, to to share the, the research, the current research that was on the portfolio and that would then um, encourage those clinicians and those GPs to refer in to us. So that was what was happening um, around three years ago. I'm not sure if things have changed or have developed in any way. Yeah, I mean, and they, they still very much work like that, but I was maybe a little bit provocative in answering your question, Craig, saying I don't think we should. So I think, um, and I can't talk for all countries you in the tell. world, but country, <laughs> countries, well, uh, I'll qualify this, I'll qualify this. But countries where there is a, a significant volume of research going on, it's not realistic to think that any individual frontline clinician will ever have a meaningful knowledge of that research base. If I, if I were Douglas or Eileen, if I were Eileen getting her diagnosis, what I would hope is, is that I am able to access all research that might be relevant to me and interesting to me and in a location that I might be able to do. And to think that that neurologist is supposed to hold all of that in their minds with everything else they're trying to do in what is a very difficult consultation is not realistic. So for me, the answer is, let's come back to Al's point earlier, is we should be focusing on educating frontline clinicians about research, about talking to people about research, and we should be making it easy for people who are then interested, like I would have been, to get into a scenario where they can <coughs> access the research that's going on. So the way we've tried to build on, on Gail's experience in the UK is by collecting together data around all of the research that's going on collect data about people like Eileen who are interested in research and then try and match them together. Try and say, look, look Eileen, you, you, you live in Brisbane, these are the research studies going on, you have a decision now to make about which research studies you want to take part in. So, so when I said they shouldn't, I mean we should educate doctors about research rather than try and educate them about every single study. As you know, Piers, we agree entirely on that. We've been talking about it for 15 years. The only way to, <laughs> to, to, the only way to successfully deliver research is to get doctors out of the way. Absolutely. <laughs> Speak directly to the participants, not the patients, but the participants. So, Douglas, I think you wanted to say something. You had your hand raised. and uh, I did, uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to say... I'm sorry? Then we're going to go to another poll. Okay. I just wanted to say that... Uh, Eileen and myself have also been involved with non-drug clinical trials as well, psychosocial. Uh, psychosocial type trials, and probably over the time at least a dozen. What I wanted to say about that, though, is that some of those trials, one of them particularly that stood out really well was we had this researcher come to our house and interviewed Eileen and myself. It was to do with lifestyle type stuff. And, and relationships between us uh, as someone living with dementia and myself as a care partner. The questions that were asked were really quite confusing for me and for Eileen. And I asked this person, I said, when you develop these questions, did you consult with a person living with dementia as well to kind of see whether they understood the questions as well? And I was told no. So one of the things that we would like to see as well is that people with dementia need to be included as part of the consultants in developing the kind of questions and so, and so on, and not just as participants. Clearly, that particular example was not a very good example of, of researchers really considering and being person-centered to the person with dementia. We did, we did get a comment, Douglas, just after you and Eileen spoke um, from one of, the, one of the, the people in the webinar to say thank you for sharing your, your, your story with them because they said, well, we're really going to take home a lot of the, the issues you've raised and how we design, how we conduct research. So there was a, 
specific one that some of the researchers on the call wanted to say a big thank you. Oh, um, okay, well, thank so, you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so why don't we go to poll number three, um, which if my notes are right, what do you think are the barriers to taking part in dementia research? So we've kind of had our opinion around the table, but maybe this would be interesting to hear from the, the, the participants. So we can all vote now. Excellent, it's all coming through. And of course, because it's a poll, we couldn't have a, a room for any other uh, comment, but that might be something we could pick up on later. If people want to sort of send in some ideas, I'm sure ADI would, would, would be keen to play those. So the, the, the most common most common barrier is lack of knowledge, and I guess that talks a little bit about, I mean, you had that lovely <coughs> about, about that, the barriers and enablers both in the research and in the person. So that lack of access, again, maybe this is talking a little bit about remoteness from a sense is actually running a study which is something that we can we can maybe seek to address. Stigma has been talked about fear. We might come back to fear later actually. Uh, and mistrust in the pharmaceutical industry, not to be a very specific thing around around the, the drug trials. But um uh, Craig, can yeah, I just uh, course, um, yeah. I just want to tell everybody who very kindly are sending questions that we are trying to group the questions into stands and we are answering them in the course of the panel. So the questions the panelists have been put uh, are questions that have been, uh, been sent in to us. Um, for those that we won't be able to answer because there will be quite a lot, um, we will try and pick them up as themes in the follow-up webinars. So it will be a good uh, reason to stay tuned. Sorry. Come back to the next one, exactly. <laughs> that, that would be good. Um, fantastic. So the, the, the poll, so Alison, the poll was suggesting, um, you know, I guess one of the, some of the barriers we talked about already, but one of the things, one of the critical issues is, and I think, you know, Eileen and, and, and Douglas have been involved in a clinical trial. And I made a slightly facetious comment, 800,000 people with dementia in the UK, how come only 30 in a trial? But you, there are some selection criteria, I guess, as well. The challenges we face in terms of what I was saying, again, getting in early enough, and how do you actually select the people who you think are going to benefit most? How do you overcome some of those, not quite bias, but how do you overcome those issues as well? Yeah, I, mean, I guess there's a couple of topics there. One is that trials do have some very specific criteria that people need to meet quite often, um, which, which does reduce the number of people eligible to participate. And those are usually there to, well, they are always there to make sure, A, that everyone is safe, um, because remember, it's a, a, often an experimental therapy. Uh, but also to make sure that we can get a clear answer at the end. Uh, and we're often a criticism leveled at us quite rightly is that those people on the trial don't really represent the, the general population who might end up using the drug if it, it ever gets to market. Um, I, I, I won't say that we have an answer for that question yet. I think that that is an ongoing uh, conundrum for clinical researchers. Uh, I think the other thing is that we do not necessarily have diversity within our clinical trial populations. Minorities are not well represented. Um, and it's clear that it's not a case of just putting a, uh, the trial at a hospital that is an in an area that has a diverse community because we tried that and that doesn't work. So that's something that I am working on at the moment. I don't have the answers. I think I'm going to try and test some different approaches and see what might help us. If anybody does have any insights there, I would love to hear them. So thank you very much. We've talked a lot, I and mean, I said at the beginning, there were sort of almost like three stages to this journey. And the first stage is about the entry into clinical trials. We've talked a little bit about that here. The final stage was, and we might come back to it later, is about how we manage the end of a trial better. I think we've touched on this a little bit. But one of the things which is obviously critically important is when people are involved in trials, and I think you mentioned this yourself, Eileen Douglas, is that, that information flow, that communication. I mean, some of the studies that, that, that I run and we run last up to five, 10 years, they're very open-ended studies. And one of the things we went worth exploring is how do you keep people engaged, how do you, both the researchers and the, and the course participants. So we've got people into the studies, everything's going fantastically well, 
but then how do you make sure people retain their interest? And then Dale, I know that you're very much involved in this, so maybe, and then we'll maybe go to, to, to Eileen and Douglas again, but what works well in terms of Definitely. keeping people involved? Yes, yes, I think Eileen and Douglas would certainly be able to answer that question a little better than me, but um, I guess uh, when I think about it, it's about um, providing reassurance for participants, for people who are involved. I think it's, it's about the, um, the comfort, I guess, that people feel. And I don't mean that because I know there's, there's an argument about being too nice almost when you're involving people in research because you don't want um, objectivity, subjectivity to, cut, you know, to sort of start getting involved around data collection. Uh, the whole point of research is that everything is consistent and that raters who ask all these questions are treating everybody exactly the same. So it does, you know, you are pulled a little bit between that kind of person-centeredness and, um, and data collection. But I do think there is a real importance in ensuring that um, the time that people spend when they are with us in clinics, um, for example, are, you know, they are made comfortable and that they are provided with food and drinks uh, as regularly as they need them, that they have costings brought into the research to ensure that they can have taxis to and from, because I think that causes an awful lot of anxiety for some people. Um, it, you know, so it's just things around, I guess, the practicalities for us. We found that we were able to retain, um, you know, more people with, involved in the research if they felt that that of value you, if they felt that they were doing something that was worthwhile and so um, ensuring all of that but I think also each time we saw them it was about talking through the research again um, talking through their consent ensuring that they were still feeling comfortable about taking part in the research and that they were you know still still happy to continue with that so I think just all of those things together really helped. And Eileen and, and, and Douglas, I mean, when you were, what went well in some of the trials that you were involved with? What were the things that continued to motivate you? Maybe at a more practical level from the trial center itself or the, or the people working in it that, um, that, that, that you found a benefit to, to, to keep you engaged in the project? Uh, I think, well, you know, being reimbursed for taxis and parking and all that kind of thing, I think that that really helped. Yeah, okay. I Just think that, for me, obviously. one of the things that's been helpful as well has been that um, the people that we've got to know on some of the trials have been very good resources for us as well because we run... Um, a dementia uh, advocacy group as well here in Brisbane. Uh, those researchers, they've been kind enough to provide us with information, or they've also been kind enough even to come and speak at different things that we've, you know, we've organised as well. So they've been good resources in that respect in terms of providing their time and and their expertise in helping us in areas that we we might need some help. And that's been one of the big things that I've appreciated. Yeah. And maybe Piers and Alison, just before we move on, anything from your perspective on that retention issue? In the, in the I was just gonna, there's one thing that I found really interesting in the last few, maybe six months, the last year, a lot of discussion about moving into sort of citizen science around dementia. And it's quite interesting to me how people talk about this stuff. So there's a, there's a lot of non-pharmacological research that is becomes called citizen science, and therefore we somehow think of engaging the people in those research mm. projects in some other way. And in fact, methodologically, they're really rather similar to, mm. to pharmacological trials. You know, we are just collecting data from people and use, analyzing that data to see if something works. So I think there's some really interesting thing about how, notwithstanding what you say about standardization or reducing yeah. variation, which are clearly mm. big issues for all types of research, it's very interesting for me that we've got some types, particularly research around brain training or around uh, uh, sort of online interventions, these sorts of <laughs> essentially trials are being thought of and, and communicated as uh, citizen science. We're all in this together. We're sharing. We're playing a we're playing a game for fifteen minutes a day because we're citizen scientists. Well, I'm turning up for an infusion once a month. I'm a citizen scientist. It's just my blood rather than my brain. So I think there's a really interesting thing to be done about how we communicate what it is to take part in any type of research. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I also think 
there are some other things as well as the, the practical logistics of ensuring uh, that you're not out of pocket. You know, some companies do have people that can go to individuals' homes, if that's helpful, and, and do some of the study assessments there. Um, telemedicine, where you might have some of your visits over the internet, as we're doing now, is, is also things. Using, now that everybody has, well, not everybody, but a lot of people have smartphones, using apps on those to collect data, um, the sort of Fitbits uh, and things like that that can, can collect. So I think I see a lot of interest in how we can utilize technology in the future to minimize burden. Um, and, and if we can do that in a robust way, that might really help us. And I think just to build on that, there's a couple of key questions here. That I think what we're trying to do is look at how we can bridge that gap to be able to run the clinical trials and clinical research in people's own homes. And some of the technology that Alison was referring to may allow us to be able to do, maybe not the initial assessment, but might need to take place in the university hospital, but thereafter, a lot of the assessments could be done remotely, and that will make it easier for people all over the world uh, to get involved. Now, we've only got about 10 minutes left, and I want to do a couple of things before we finish, but there's some very good specific questions that maybe I'll just pick. One was about questions on whether there are trials in young onset, I'm presuming it's young onset and um, multi dementia. The, 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 there is um, various different types, if you like, or different conditions which can cause dementia to start earlier in life than the usual, you know, 65 years old and older. Um, the, there is something called the Diane Network, the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Disease Network, Diane, which is a, Europe, which is a global network for people with familial Alzheimer's disease. And there are certainly centres I know of in Melbourne, and I think also Brisbane and Perth. Um, but, but, and all over the world, but, but mainly, dare I say it, in the, in the, the North America, Europe, and, and Australia, unfortunately. Um, but there are, there are, there is a, if you go to the Diane website, you'll be able to find out more about that. Um, and there's also some questions about um, what are researchers looking for when running clinical trials. But I think, I mean, the, the easiest answer to that is it depends on the research question. And there's so much research we're trying to do to understand the stage of the disease before dementia develops, look how best to intervene, etc. But what's critically important from a research perspective is having a very clear research question. Why are we doing that study? And communicating that, maybe working on that research question, they say with people who are going to benefit most, either those at risk of dementia or developing dementia. So what I wanted to do in the last 10 minutes, or we wanted to do in the last 10 minutes, was read on our poll to see if we've changed any attitudes out there. Uh, so we had a couple of polls we, we said at the beginning about would you volunteer for research and what your knowledge of research is. So we're going to run those again. And then once we've had those, I'm going to just go around the panel for just you know a quick 30 seconds of what is a key take-home message for them over the last hour and a half. Um, remember to plug in your computer, if you one of them. Uh, make sure the battery's charged. Uh, but, but, but that aside, other key messages uh, around the panel. And I'll say a few words, and then Paola, I don't know if you want to have the final word before we, before we close the session. So let's rerun the poll. Um, and I've got the results from the previous one here, so I can see if we've had any impact whatsoever. This is action research. So, how much do you know about dementia research or clinical trials? You have to talk amongst yourself and then to recopy it, otherwise we'll, we'll delete all the ones. No, I've got, got the results. I wrote them down. Delete them. Get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. No recall bias here. Go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Off we go. So knowledge of research is what we're doing. Yeah. How yeah. much do you know about research and clinical trials? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so uh, oh no, 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 Okay, we, we failed. Right, so maybe we've, maybe we've had some dropouts. We've got a sort of a, a, a tension bias. We um, had about 20 people, 30 class, and the previous polls. Well, okay, so, so I know a lot has changed, I would say dropped, has changed from 17% to 13%. I reckon that's within a margin of error that you can accept. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, 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 the I am comfortable with my knowledge has increased yes. significantly. <laughs> <laughs> Not even a trend. It's, it's statistically significant from 24% to 33%. I know that it has dropped quite dramatically from 52% to 44%, and nothing has always well, gone up. 
<laughs> Let's run the next call. <laughs> so I, mean, I, think, I think we've had some impact. All the all the things they knew about and dropped out. So they were all in the name of the top Right. So second question was, um, would you volunteer for dementia research? Fingers crossed around the panel. Okay. So the the no has gone up by one. <laughs> By the way, we can't track this. This is confidential. We, we, can't, we can't track it. We can't track. You can't find who you were. But I know who you are, Sarah Gregory. Anyway. <laughs> and then, then the yeses have gone up from 34% to 45%. So that's fantastic. <coughs> yes, but we'd like to find out more. It's probably moved. It's gone down, but it's probably just moved from the 46% into the top group. Because the maybes have also kind of stayed the same at 20% to 18%. So I think this has been a success. Hello. I am so happy. Let's this is really <laughs> okay. uh, A lot more questions that I am aware we need to answer. A lot of questions still coming in. Thank you so much to those that have been sending questions in all kinds of media. But yes, we need to continue the conversation. I think that this has opened. Uh, clearly, obviously, the panel has been brilliant and answered quite some difficult questions. But this has also opened some more questions. There are questions on diversity coming up, on also questions on um, how do you then deal with different types of dementia and whether there are trials that address those? Actually, there's a lot of detailed questions that are, are very interesting. Where do you find more information? Um, I can tell you that there's a number of websites where you can find more information. One of the immediate follow-ups is certainly to give you a link uh, to where on our website you can find uh, more information. But so there are also others and we can inform participants uh, about those. Um, so and there are a few other points that we can follow up in the immediate future and certainly a lot that we will follow up in the next couple of webinars. So I want to just go around the panel and, and obviously come to, to Douglas and Eileen as well. 30 seconds. Start with Piers, then Gail, then Alison, and then we'll go to, to Eileen and Douglas. What's your key take-home message, your key sort of perception from today's so I think my mobilization okay. so I think this is a fantastic start I think Alzheimer's Disease International are doing a fantastic job here I think there's a massive massive potential listening to this for ADI members to be involved in mobilization mobilization of people mobilization of information that rerunning of the poll around barriers I, I think we have a tremendous opportunity I agree there's a lot of complexity, but I think it's a real opportunity to, to tackle a lot of these barriers in really quite simple, inexpensive ways that can be uh, spread globally really rather quickly around mobilizing people, mobilizing interest, mobilizing information, giving people that information and access. I agree there's all sorts of things to think about and complexities around that, but my take home message is uh, I think absolutely that. We, we need to be working together with the associations and with the people on, on the webinar to mobilise information and people more quickly. Gail? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's about managing expectation. Okay. I think being able to have discussions with those people that are actually living with dementia and their families um, around how we can help support them through the whole journey. How was that? Uh, for me, uh, the need for greater transparency uh, uh, in an appropriate language that is meaningful and resonates with potential participants and their families. Um, and a reminder of something that I already knew, which is how important it is to not only get uh, input from potential participants and people living with dementia, but actually to implement it. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, Eileen, the, 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 the sound bite, the one thing that you take out of this meeting more than anything else? Um, I still say hope. Hope for my sons and my, gra and my grandkids. And Douglas? Uh, listening to this, it's kind of... Um, given me hope that things might change. And for you, Douglas? I guess for me, it's exciting to know that uh, 
what has happened with the ADI in initiating the whole process of having conversations about research, I think has been a really much needed thing. And, and one of the things that came out of the conversation was the lack of knowledge. And one of the key areas where there was a, a weak link in the lack of knowledge, which I'm glad to see is not only in Australia, but apparently in the UK as well, is for us to educate our GPs a little bit better and probably some of our specialists as well. So I think the whole concept of talking <coughs> about what you've done and having conversations about research and what it means and actually even picking up on a word, um, you know, that word research that was mentioned as well, that the language is so important. I, I, you know, I could say more about that, but I think that is something that I think researchers are going to look at a little bit deeper as well. But it's been exciting to be able to be part of, uh, of an initial conversation about talking about research to further research to help people living with dementia more successfully. So thanks very much, Douglas. And I just, so my, my final words, and then I'm going to pass to Paola to, to close us off in the last couple of minutes is, you know, peers are talking about mobilization, globalization, getting in touch with people who are, it, 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 I don't like the word remote, they're not remote themselves, they're remote to their search centers, but finding ways and methods to really bring that to the <coughs> Honesty, I think, came out from Gail and Alison. Now, managing expectations is being honest with people. So it's an great transparency about what your research is for, why we're doing it. And also, like you said, about how one implements it. I mean, for me, um, I, I hate to say it, I mean, you stole my thunder. For me, it's all about hope. Uh, but I'm, I, 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 I'm, I wake up every morning and do research because I, I hope things will get better. But I'm actually in some ways in a privileged position as an academic researcher because I want to turn hope into expectation. I really think yeah. you shouldn't live off hope if things are going to get better. We've got to turn that hope into a realization that we can actually uh -huh. make a difference. Uh, yeah. So that's my final word. Other than just before I pass the power, to so give a massive thank you to Edelman, who have actually hosted us here today yes. in these fantastic facilities, and um, to Roche, who sponsored the meeting, and of course to all of our friends and colleagues at Alzheimer's Disease International, who are just really pushing the boundaries and trying to make the world a better place for people with dementia and there was a, a risk of dementia, not just here in the UK or in Australia, but truly all over the world. So thank you so much for all of your efforts. Truly appreciate it. Thank you, Craig. Um, I have to say, this has been wonderful. I think as I walked into ADI, I thought here is a lot of reserve to the community that are really trying to make things better for people living with dementia and their families. Mm -hmm. Here's a lot of people with dementia that are having a number of questions. Is there any way we can bring them together to talk on the same thing about this very complicated thing that we know is complicated, but at the end of the day, we're all aiming for the same objective, so we should find a way to, to get this through. So I think we succeeded. Thank you, everybody. Can I make one point just before we end? We are, we are here on time, just 30 seconds left. <laughs> uh, can I mention that this series is going to be recorded for everyone, everywhere to listen to it? At, at from any country, in any time zone. So please do tell people that couldn't join us today that it will be available. So it will be the whole series. And we're also starting to work on one in Spanish. Don't know if we managed to get it done, but we are certainly trying. So um, thank you for everybody, to everybody for joining. And thank you for the wonderful panelists for participating and for being candidly honest. It's only by being honest that we can bring the whole thing forward. So thank you very much. Let's hope that we get talking even more about the Mancha Research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.